Well, we're glad you're here. So delighted that uh, we can join together again. And for all of you who are watching online, we encourage you, come on out on a Wednesday night. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. We have a great time of fellowship before. Uh, we had such a good time of fellowship and so much eaten that we started a little late. So if you're joining us a little late, uh, better late than never is the old saying. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're starting a brand new series today. Uh, it's a series called The Family Matters. Uh, I wonder if it does, The Family Matters. Uh, we look around and uh, families are uh, struggling right now. And, uh, you know, this series was meant not just uh, to just reaffirm some of the biblical truths uh, about the things that God wants us to do as a family, but I think it's, it's a primer to really help families that are struggling. So I would encourage you, if you know someone that uh, maybe they're struggling in their marriage, this would be a good ser series to come out to. If you're struggling raising your children, this would be a good series to come out to because we really have a crisis on our hands. We live in a world right now that is completely out of control. We see things that are happening all around us that we don't quite understand. Crime is on the rise. Inflation is obscene. Uh, the, the chaos that we see in our institutions, uh, even in our own government, it should cause us to shake in our boots, I suppose, if we weren't believers. And uh, the one source of stability that you would want to have in these troubled times, a place that traditionally was a place of stability, was our home. But right now, many children are waking up. They woke up this morning, and they entered the world that had chaos all around, and their home was no better. They have no refuge they have no place to run to find strength and stability. And that's what the family is all about. God created the family to be the bulwark against a lot of the, uh, uh, the obstacles and challenges that we face. So many families that we see, you know them, you've met them, they're in disarray. And many, many times these things are happening because of poor decisions. The poor decisions that we have made have led to many people. Uh, they maybe started out uh, with promise, and they thought they had this bright future. Some people, they said, yeah, we're going to get married. They got married, and they had this unbridled enthusiasm about the future. But they fast forward a couple years, and this match made in heaven turns into a wrestling match. <laughs> As each person vies for dominance and control in the relationship, and uh, they're at each other's throat. And what you end up with are two empty, disillusioned people who feel their only option is divorce. Uh, and I am, uh, I, I am very clearly aware that uh, this is going on uh, in epidemic proportions. Uh, some have decided well, I don't like marriage. Look what happened to my parents. So they decided just, I won't get married at all. That's, that's a good thing. They choose to simply live together with the person that they're with at the time. They make no promises, and they offer only the very minimal amount of commitment. So if things get rough, hey, you can leave. Either person can simply walk away from the relationship. No harm, no foul, and we're out of here. And what we often see in these homes are revolving doors of many different partners, uh, creating a lot of uncertainty and instability for everyone involved. And, uh, and then, of course, you have some of those. Some of those people out there who have managed to stay together, but they're miserable. They're miserable. They, they live in constant strife, and their fighting uh, is a daily occurrence, and stress that occurs in this relationship, this friction, it's almost unbearable. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest losers in these situations are usually the kids because they grow up without a sense of security. They don't have very much guidance. They don't have an example to follow that they can uh, pass on, something modeled to them that they can do for themselves. And um, they, don't, they don't get the love that they so desperately crave. 
not in those type of homes, because everybody's out for themselves. And is, is it any wonder that the kids uh, that we see today in many of the schools are really out of control these days? It all sounds pretty dismal, doesn't it? Uh, but I have some good news for you. The reason that we're doing this is it doesn't have to be this way. God has a better way, and I'm convinced that he wants us to discover that way. And if we, and if we want to take the time, perhaps it's maybe right under our nose. There are answers on how we can have better families and more beautiful, abundant, fulfilling relationships. Let me encourage you about something as we start this series. God wants to bless families. God is the one who invented this thing called the family. So in this series, regardless of wherever your situation is, wherever you're at, I believe God wants to challenge all of us to seek something better. He wants us to see a, a better way to do things. And if your situation, if it's less than ideal, then that's fine. You've come to the right place. If you've come from a broken family, God says that there's hope. God loves broken people. You know that? God loves broken people, and he loves to give us new uh, direction and new hope. If you come from a family that has its struggles, um, but it's still in, intact, you're still moving forward, God says, that's great, but you can do better. And if you're in a strong family where everyone seems to be working together, um, I think God is saying, I want to even take you deeper. You thought you were doing good, but I want to take you even deeper. I want you to get even more out of your family than you thought was possible. I want you to get more out of your marriage than you thought was even conceivable. So that's what we're going to talk about. If you have all your lesson sheets that we have handed out, uh, we're going to look at some things. And uh, as we embark upon this topic, um, what I've been trying to create is the, a sense of urgency, okay? Okay. There's an urgent need for us to deal with and explore this topic, and that's God's design for the family. And I am alarmed about it. I mean, I really am. I, I have to deal with a lot of situations. As a pastor, I'm sometimes on the other side of the door talking to people that are deeply distressed about their situation. And apparently... Um, the reason this is all happening is people have forgotten what this plan that God created looks like. The modern family today is, is fast becoming unrecognizable from God's original blueprint. It appears that this image of the traditional family, it's, it's in free fall, and, and unless there's some serious course corrections in our culture, this institution is going to face an early demise. I really believe that. I really believe that um, we are the remnant, maybe, in the church of what God's design is for the family. These might sound a little like uh, extreme exaggerations to you, these predictions, uh, but I want you to think about the statistics uh, of the American family today. I did a little bit of research from the Pew Research Center. I looked, at, looked up some of these statistics on family. You know, it used to be the norm that you would have a two-parent family, two parents. But today that number is at a low watermark. If you see the first statistic up there, do you got these statistics? 66% of families today are two-parent families. Now, that means, or 69%. So that means that 31% of families are other than two-parent families, all right? Uh, you go on there, and this is, by the way, compared to just, you know, maybe 50 years ago, the number was at 87% of families were two-parent families. Uh, the amount of single-parent families has grown dramatically, Today, look at the number, the percentage of all homes in America that are headed by a single parent. 31% of homes in America are headed by a, excuse me, by a single parent. Some of it uh, for no fault of their own. If, you're a, if your mate died, I guess that's something that happens, right? It's an unfortunate thing. But a lot of these things could have maybe been avoided. 
single parent homes. In uh, 1960, just 5% of all births occurred outside of marriage. Do you realize? Only 5%. It happened even back in 1960 that there were marriages out of wedlock. But by 1970, this number doubled to 11%. And by 2000, and it's grown since then, but by 2000, one-third of all the births occurred to unmarried women. One-third. That's an amazing statistic to think that people are bringing children into this world and they're already in the negative with the resources that are necessary to raise children these days. They're already behind the eight ball. And that's just an amazing thought. Uh, and then... Then we, we all know about this st statistic of divorce. People treat marriage like a disposable razor, I wrote down on your notes. Uh, one in two marriages stay together these days. One in two. Where, where is, and then here's the sad part. It's not really much better in the Christian community. You would think that all oh, Christians are doing so much better than non-Christians. It's not so. I think Satan is attacking families all over the place. Does, he's indiscriminate. He doesn't care. He wants to destroy God's design. Uh, here's one more statistic for you. Um, what percentage of children do you think are living in blended families? You know what blended families are, right? Those are families defined by a household with a step-parent or a step-sibling or a half-sibling. How many, how many people, how, what percentage you got there? We got a number up there? 16% of children are living in blended families right now. And uh, no other, um, I, I just don't think that there's no other way to understand it than to say that our, our families are in crisis. The number of children in these families, uh, in the average family today, has declined. In 1950, the average number of children in a home was over three. They had over three children. Today, the average is, what is that? I got one point, I think, nine, four, 1 1.9 children. They can't even get up to two. Uh, in, our, in order for a culture to maintain a population, every family, just to maintain the population, unless, of course, you have open borders, but in order to maintain the population of a society, you have to have, I think it's 2.4 children on average per family in order to maintain your population. And, uh, and we're not even keeping up with the pace of population to maintain our society. And then add to this the threat of same-sex arrangements. In 2021, it is estimated that there were over 700,000 same-sex couples in America. I don't know how accurate that is, but I know that it's only worse that number has only grown as the culture is just relentless in trying to redefine the family into some new distorted image that's unlike anything historically that we've ever seen and unlike anything that God had ever designed or thought of. So as we look around at the cultural landscape, it's clear that there's a breakdown in the social fabric that holds us all together. The family is the strength and the bedrock to our society. These changes that we're seeing have forced us to grapple with some really hard questions. And I think for us as Christians, and individually, each and one of us, we need to ask a very hard question. Because the hard question is, could it be that we're just not following the blueprint? Do we want to do things God's way? That's the, that's the question. Do we want to do things God's way? I think at the end of the day, we want to be able to say, listen, God, I'm going to do it your way, and I'll let the chips fall where they may. You're the one who came up with this idea of the family. So if you're the one who came up with the idea of a family, I'm going to just do it your way. Now, you know, I, I just have to preface this by saying it's true. There are things that happen. There are unfortunate things that happen in life. And sometimes things aren't ideal. And you have to make the best of it. But the goal is to shoot for the ideal. 
The goal is to shoot for God's best. And, um, you know, like I said before, there are a multiplicity of views about what a family should look like. And there's a concerted effort to, to have a, an acceptance of all these new norms that we've already discussed. So our challenge as believers is to have, and here it is, the courage to go against the flow. We've got it. This takes courage. There's a lot of pressure to just say, listen, we're living in the 21st century. We got a new definition of the family. We have to have the courage to say, well, I like the old definition, the one that God gave us. And, and there's this enormous pressure, not just in our society, but there is an enormous pressure on the church to conform to these new standards. And the battle is really raging over what constitutes a family. It's become very fierce. And society is going to tell you that families, they come in all shapes and sizes. They're all different, but don't judge. None of them is better than the, than any other. They're all, they're all equally good. Don't go saying yours is better, right? Is that true? Is being raised in a single-parent family just as good as being raised in a two-parent home? A little later on, we're going to be talking about the statistics of, of fatherless homes, and it is staggering the difference between a home with a father and without a father. Is there really no difference between a home with two mommies as opposed to a traditional home with one mom and one dad? A male presence and a female presence? And if, you, if you're sitting here saying, I, I kind of think that's true. If you believe that each of these arrangements are equally good, it's just as good to have a same-sex um, parenting of a child as to have one man and one woman, then this study is probably not for you because that's not the way that God designed it. And we believe that God's design is superior to all other arrangements. Now, I know that some people might listen to this and they hear that and they say, how could he say that? Oh, that guy is so bigoted and he's looking down and he's so judgmental. Well, I'm just telling you that I look at the results and God's design always works and it's superior to all other arrangements. His design, if we really follow his design fully, is the ideal environment for us not only to have a happy home with our marriage, but to raise children and find satisfaction and fulfillment. No other structure that is created out there can compare to God's master plan. I believe that. I am convinced of it. And so we want to look at what God has to say. That's what this study is about. We want to look at God's design for the family, God's design for marriage, God's design for child rearing, God's design for uh, how to deal with widows and orphans, and God's design, and we can go down the list. There are, there are instructions that we've been given. Now, admittedly, there will be times when we're, we're going to face less than desirable circumstances. I've already said that. But... What we're, what we're saying is, is if everybody takes, takes a, a hard look at this and, 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 and there's a complete buy-in by the whole family, every member in the family, then we're going to see success. If one party decides to buck the system, then the nuclear family is going to suffer. It's just not going to be able to work the way God wanted to because this takes mutual goodwill by everyone involved. So let's just start at the very beginning, okay? Let's just get some, let's just get some uh, foundational truths in, 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 uh, in front of us. We're going to go back to the garden. God gave us a template, and he said, here's a template to build on. And uh, some things, you know, I think God says are pretty obvious. I think we have kind of figured it out. Mankind has had uh, this understanding of what a family, a traditional family looks like through for thousands and thousands of years since creation. Uh, man tries to distort it, but God 
really set this in place from the very beginning. Look what he says in Genesis 1.28. He says, and this is God speaking. He's giving instructions. He's looking at this man that he's created. He says, God bless them. And God said to them, to Adam and Eve, he says, be fruitful and multiply. And I want you to fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, there were a number of instructions there. But that first half, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The goal from the very beginning in God's economy was for us to fill the earth. That was what he wanted us to do. And it takes certain elements in order for that to occur. You can't fill the earth. If you only have all males or all females. I, I, I just, there's a little bit of simple biology there. And uh, we're, this isn't a biology course, but let me just, just trust me on this. You cannot fill the earth. You cannot be fruitful and multiply if you only have males or only have females. You have to have both. So it just, by the very basic premise of wanting to fill the earth and see the population of the earth grow, which is God's desire, then you needed to have an organization, a structure of a man and woman. The goal was to have a specific structure and an organizational makeup that would enhance and make it possible to be fruitful and multiply. So you get my point, right? In the next chapter, if you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, he continues on. He gives some more instructions. And uh, look what he says here. He says here, um, for this reason, and this is right after saying, your bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He, this is a, a wonderful picture of this, this uh, one flesh relationship of a husband and wife. But he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here we have in two simple verses some wonderful principles. I, I just want to bring out some of them. You could glean a little bit more if you wanted to study this deeper, but there are Four timeless truths that transcend every generation and every culture that God wants for this starting point, the foundation, which is marriage. The first thing he said, and he instructed us to do, he said in this new relationship of a man and woman filling the earth, he says he instructed them to leave. He instruct them, leave your what? Leave your mother and your father. So that means leave. I mean literally remove yourself from the, under their house. Now Adam and Eve didn't have to leave their mother and their father. But he was laying down a principle here. That you are now an independent new unit all to yourself. A husband and wife now become an independent unit that God has created, and he has sanctioned, and it's his sacred union that he has put together, okay? So he says, I want you to leave, and then he makes it clear that this union needs to be permanent. This wasn't just something that is for a few moments, and then if you get tired of the other person, you can just leave. The goal of marriage is to have this one flesh union for life. And that's why we say in marriage, what do we say in marriage uh, vows? Till death do us part. And some people are saying, bring it on, Lord, the sooner the better. <laughs> those are for those who are having miserable marriages because they're missing out on doing things God's way, unfortunately. But I'm telling you that marriage can be the most intoxicating, wonderful thing in the whole planet. And it's a wonderful gift that God has given us. So he says, first of all, I want you to leave. And then he makes it clear that I want you to understand that this union, 
Once it's together, what God has joined together, what does he say? Let no man tear asunder. That's an instruction from God. Very clearly, God hates divorce, he says in the Old Testament. And then he makes it clear, he goes on, he says, the goal of this union, this one flesh union, this independent relationship, this permanent relationship, is to have oneness. Oneness. What does he say there? He says, the, he says and they shall become one flesh. Not just physically one. There is this beautiful merging together of two lives into one new unit. It's an indivisible unit. And that is really the super glue to the whole family. Right here, this picture of this strong, uh, indivisible partnership, this union between a husband and a wife. He says, what God joins together, let no man tear asunder. That includes you. God says, I want, I want your goal, the number one goal in marriage, is to have oneness with your mate. So that means if anything jeopardizes your oneness with your mate, then you shouldn't do it. If there's anything that you do that would jeopardize you being one with your mate, that could undermine your oneness emotionally, spiritually, physically, then you shouldn't go there. God says, listen, man, your goal is to be one. It should be your primary focal point of your marriage is I want to be one. My goal is I want to be one with my wife. And I don't want anything to put that in jeopardy. And if we are vicious about it and, and we're, uh, you know, relentless in, in our defense and putting our guards up to make sure that our, that our relationship is, is rock solid, then guess what? You're going to have that foundation in place that God wants. This is such, and it's a beautiful thing too. I'm telling you, it's wonderful to have someone to go through life with that you're on the same page, you're a team, you're working together, you got each other's back. My wife is my ultimate cheerleader. She's the one who cheers me on. All of you, you could all criticize me. You could all tell me you're the worst pastor we've ever had at this church. If my wife believes in me, that's okay. But if she didn't believe in me, well, it wouldn't really matter what you said. You could all think I'm the greatest thing since Billy Graham, Spurgeon. There's another Spurgeon on our hands. Look at this guy. He's fantastic. And that's because oneness is what God is looking for. There's something special about oneness. And the last thing, and this is kind of very similar to this other part, but the character of this union, not only the goal of the union, but the character of the union is to create intimacy. It kind of, you can see the, the partnership between oneness and intimacy. Intimacy, this closeness. It says that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There is this beautiful vulnerability that a man and a wife have with each other. I'm telling you, it's just what God really wanted is for you to find somebody, you women and you men, to find a mate that you can be yourself around, that you can be real with, someone that you could be able to share your deepest secrets. You know, this intimacy thing, it, it comes in a lot of forms. We always gravitate and think about the sexual component of this, but intimacy is on so many levels. One of the things my wife says um, that she feels, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, but there's probably nothing so intimate as praying with your spouse. Ah, oh, that's an intimate thing. You're, you're sitting there and you're pouring out your heart with each other. That's a very vulnerable thing to do, right? It's creating a closeness because you're coming together before the throne of grace and you're crying out to God together. It's a, it's a very intimate thing. And so if you want to create and build intimacy in your marriage, I would recommend the first prescription is start to pray together. If you're not praying together, 
You really need to because it'll create intimacy and it'll create oneness. The family that prays together stays together. That sounds corny, but it's true. It's true. The statistics show it. The statistics show that families and husbands and wives that pray together have a, have a much, much lower incidence of divorce than those that don't. So, you know, you could just say, well, you know, you're making, you're overstating the value of prayer. I'll just pray on my own over here and they can pray on their own over there. And isn't that good enough? No, the whole thing is about sharing it together that makes it special. So here's, here, here's the, the bottom line on this. God created this um, pattern, this community. He started these communities. He wanted us to have this community, our own community. You kind of got to look at it as an independent community. And this community is going to change. It's going to ebb and flow. Because the husband and wife are going to, hopefully, if everything goes the way that you would think, they would have children. And then those children, there would be, that this family would grow. And it would be more members in this community. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It just makes a richness and a diversity to this individual community. And they're all interlocking, interrelated parts to the community. But it all starts with the marriage. It all starts with the marriage. So what we see here, this, this foundation here, this picture that God just gave about this union between one man and one woman. By the way, he says it again. One man and one woman in this, in this verse, right? And he says that this one man, one woman relationship, it, it is the definition of marriage. This is the, defini of, uh, uh, the definition of marriage. It's a, it's a permanent, independent relationship dedicated to having intimacy and oneness and to serve together, to work together for God's glory. God wanted us to have the family. God designed us to have the family. And there's much more that he has to say about the family. I will kind of, you know, we're, we're going to say a lot about this, but I will say that I think that if there's one takeaway you want to have with this, because I've said it many times, this is God's design, right? Is that you can do everything right that you think in your family. But if God is not part of the equation, then the family will not operate the way God designed. God needs to be at the center of your marriage. God needs to be at the center of your child rearing and your parenting. God needs to be the, at the center of all your relationships. And if God is at the center of it, well, then you're going to have a bountiful, rich, beautiful family. And families matter to God. Uh, if you have a, a godly marriage that applies godly rules, you're going to create an environment for your children that is going to just be more valuable than any schooling that they could ever get. The, the best gift you could ever give to your kids is to have a great marriage. So we're going to talk more about that. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about God's design for the operation in marriage. We're going to talk about uh, some very important, um, maybe countercultural perspectives about how men and women are, oper are to operate in a marriage. You know, things like words we don't like to use these days, like the word submission or headship or, you know, complementary versus egalitarian, you know, all that other great garbage, you know. But here's the point. God's got, a great, God's got a great setup. And if we can just follow him and trust him, he's going to give us something good. So all of this is maybe you're hurting right now. I, I hope that uh, this study is going to be a good one for you. And at the end of the day, we know that even if we're all alone, you know, that's the thing. God wants us to live in community. We were never meant to be in isolation. 
And there's a, there's a move for people not to be in families at all. That's even another, an, another growing trend where people just decide, I'm just going to stay single. I don't want to be in a family at all. And that's tragic. Uh, but how, how even more tragic would it be to not be part of the family of God? You know, as we think about this, God is giving us a model of human relationships because he wants us to give us a picture of a relationship that he wants to have with us. There is a wonderful family that we can be a part of, all of us. The Bible says that it's an opportunity that all of us can avail ourselves of. We can be part of the family of God. God says, I'd like to adopt you. I'd like to have you join my family. I'd like you to be a part of my family. And I would make you sons and daughters if you'll only put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you're missing out on being a part of the best family of all. I hope that you have. And if you haven't, now is a great time to do it. Let's pray. Father, um, I thank you for this um, introduction, this uh, time right now to think a, a little bit more about um, the seriousness of this topic. But I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be practical, to come up with some really uh, great um, guidelines for how we can operate in our homes. Uh, I pray, Lord, that our homes would be a reflection of you. And uh, Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that has never joined your family, that has never become part of the family of God, that today they might just say, Lord, I, I, I want to be part of your family. And I know that my sin is separating me from you, and it's caused a problem that I cannot fix. Uh, but I believe that Jesus paid for my sins, and he washed them away. He, he paid the penalty for my sins, and I believe that, and I'm trusting in Jesus to be my Savior. And I ask, Lord, that um, uh, you would uh, allow me to be a part of your family. And I guarantee you, um, you'll be so glad that you received this invitation to be a part of the family of God. So I pray for that, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.